Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. It's Open Line First Monday. Now, it used to be Open Line First Friday, which fit in with our devotional schedule. I'm not sure what First Mondays are, but it's our opportunity to keep with the idea of having one program every month that is specifically designed for you to ask your questions, some of you maybe you've been saving up from previous programs, about the journey of following Jesus Christ and becoming a faithful Catholic. Anything you might have questions about, about the Catholic Church and its teachings. My guest this evening is Dr. Kenneth Howell. Ken has been with us before, and I've looked forward to having Ken back. Here we are in the start of our fourth season. Kenneth was with me the very first time that we appeared together with Mother Angelica back in 1996. We talked about the Coming Home Network. It was when we were talking with Mother that she showed great interest in the Coming Home Network, and out of that time with Mother, the Journey Home program idea arose. And so it's good to have Ken back. Uh, this is important. You're an important part of this program, so if you would, start calling us even now with your questions at one 800 221 Nine four six zero, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Ken, welcome back. Thank you, Marcus. It's great to be back with you. I think this is the first time you've been here with a new set, though. It right? is. I can see we're, we're right next door to the Vatican. That's so right. That's it's really nice. <laughs> Every Monday we make this like... trip to be by the Vatican. <laughs> it's great. Uh, but it's great mm-hmm. having you back. Yeah. Uh, and what is exciting to me, besides the fact that so many things that you and I could share about our journey together of following Christ and coming into the church, um, is just seeing how the Lord has opened up doors for you over the last four, five, or six years. Mm -hmm. When you look back, I remember when you were uh, still a Presbyterian, struggling with becoming Catholic, you would call me, Mm -hmm. and we would struggle with those issues. And then when you became Catholic, and for a while were unemployed, employed with the Coming Home Network Mm part-time, as you were still trying to discern, but in your heart was to be still a teacher, two PhDs, still using those two PhDs. I wondered if the door would ever open. And then the last time you're on my program, I remember we went out for steak afterwards, or fish. I'm sure it was a Friday night, so we went out for fish <laughs> afterwards. And you were hesitant, but I remember you finally you said, Mark, I've got to tell you something, because you were working for me. Well, what did you tell me? Tell the audience what's happened in the last year or so. Well, it was really an amazing, an amazing story because um, at that particular point in my life, I had gone through a renewal of my own consecration to God in terms of giving my life totally to what He wanted to do, and I really didn't think that that would involve university teaching anymore. Uh, but out of the blue, a priest uh, in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, where the University of Illinois is, called me and asked if I would be interested in helping him as he teaches classes on Catholicism in the University of Illinois. And I was very reluctant, but after a couple of months of prayer and thought, um, it seemed very clear that we should go. So in 1998, uh, I moved to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and I began teaching courses on Catholicism uh, at the university. Mm -hmm. During the two years, uh, these past two years, uh, it's been a very busy time, a very fruitful time. I'm at part of one of the most exciting Newman centers in the country. Uh, We have five full-time priests working for us. We have seven sisters, and the Orthodox Catholic faith is being taught uh, in in Bible studies, in fellowship groups, in in rosary groups, and all kinds of things. And we have probably between 2,000 and 3,000 students coming to Mass every Sunday. And on a daily Mass, we have three daily Masses. We have about 150 students coming to Mass Mm -hmm. every day. Um, the faith of the students is alive, and it's a wonderful place to work. Just this past academic year, this past September, we've begun the new uh, Newman Institute of Catholic Thought, and I'm the director of that, mm-hmm. and that deals a little bit more with the academic side of, of research and interaction with other uh, professors on campus. So it's, it's a fulfillment of that old psalm, wait, and the Lord will give you the desires of your well, heart. Well, that's certainly the case in, in yeah, my life. That's really, that's really great yeah. to hear. And you work for a, a priest who's a convert himself. Yes, he is. He was, a, he was raised a Lutheran, um, and he um, then drifted away from any church at all during his college years, uh, graduate of the Naval Academy. Uh, Father Stuart Swetland, uh, then at Oxford University in mm-hmm. England, was studying for a master's degree, and he came in contact with these Catholics, and they found that they were people that not only used their head, but their hearts were in love with God. 
And that really gradually led him back to the church. After he finished his tour of duty in the Navy, uh, he discerned a call to the priesthood. And now he's an ordained priest in the uh, Diocese of Peoria, Illinois. Well, we need to get him on the program. Oh, sometime. he's a wonderful man. Let's we'll plan that. Uh, make sure we get the information. But for those that may not remember your story, how about a one or two minute summary of your own journey into the Catholic faith? One well, or two minutes. I mean, it's not a long time. But no. Well, but, but back, uh, back around 1990, I, I remember first consciously beginning to search questions about the Eucharist. And over the next four or five years, I began teaching courses on the Eucharist in a Presbyterian seminary where I was working at the time. Uh, it was during that time that I came to the conviction in my mind that, uh, that the scriptures indeed taught that our Lord intended and that the church fathers confirmed that the bread and the wine properly consecrated, validly consecrated, uh, are indeed the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. That conviction I knew was different than my own Protestant background, so I began to search more into the Catholic Church. The more that I came and studied the Catholic Church and all of its beauty and rich uh, richness, the more I began to see that the Eucharist is the very center of the Church. And so it was a day of conversion for me in which I actually came not only to believe with my mind, but to be converted in my heart, and I knew that I had to be able to receive the sacred body and blood of Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. That was the day that I knew then I had to become Catholic. I do remember also your journey was a little bit like that That prayer, I believe, helped my unbelief, in the sense yeah. that there was, there was the struggling years for you, the oh. time in which you had to nail down not only the beliefs, but the impact on your vocation, mm -hmm. on your life, on your family. Yeah. Remember, that was a rough time. As, and that's why you worked with me for so long with the Coming Home Network to help others. Oh, absolutely. With the same issues. So there's so many people out there that have life-shaking experiences when they decide to become Catholic, especially those, of course, who are Protestant clergy. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are many people who are finding, of course, and you know you better than I know, how, um, how wonderful it is to see this, this almost like a flood of, mm -hmm. of, of Protestant ministers who are seeing the beauty of the church. Well, to remind the audience that this little time of, of chatter between mm -hmm. Kenneth and I in this part of the program is to uh, prime the pump for your questions as soon as we have a phone call or an email that uh, looks like a good one to take, we'll take it. Because tonight we want to get as many of your calls and emails in as we can. But, but another, just another thought to prime the pump. I heard recently that you had given some talks on this new document released called mm -hmm. Dominus Jesus. Someone corrected me because last week I said Dominus Jesus. <laughs> I, I never did take Latin, and maybe I will someday. But Dominus Jesus. And the critique that is out there of this document it sadly seems to come from people that didn't take the time to read the document clearly or with an open mind. Because you hear people saying, oh, once again, here's the Catholic Church teaching it's the only true church and that no other vocations are valid and everyone outside the church uh, is not going to be saved. You know, once again, is that what Dominus Jesus teaches? What does the church teach about this important issue? Well, this is a very important document that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith has issued with the full endorsement of the Holy Father. Um, and really... When you look at the document carefully, there's nothing new being taught in this document. Mm -hmm. But it's a clarification because of certain tendencies in Catholic theologians that have taken certain ecumenical tendencies in a wrong way. What the document teaches is what the Bible teaches and what Christian history has maintained. Any Orthodox with a little low, any Orthodox Christian should believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world. Our Lord himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm. And when he, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That's what the document affirms. But the document also affirms that that's the one and only Savior established one church, mm. and that that church he gave through the apostles and founded in the early centuries, centuries of Christianity. That document then affirms that that one church subsists in the Catholic Church. And what that means is that the fullness of all of Christ's gifts have been given to the Catholic Church, but the totality of the Church is not in the formal boundaries of the Church. Mm -hmm. As to say, not everybody who's in the mystical body of Christ, but through baptism, is actually a formal member of the Church. Mm -hmm. But the fullness of the sacraments, of the doctrines that Christ taught his apostles, all of this is fully articulated within the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. The practical implication of that is that the, cat, the church is necessary for salvation because if you took the church out of the world, 
you wouldn't have the source of salvation in Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in the world today. Mm -hmm. We might have a Bible, which is, which is important, of course, yeah. but you wouldn't have a body of people, and you wouldn't have a magisterium or a hierarchy to be able to lead and guide to the church. Make sure we're interpreting the Bible correctly. Exactly. But on the other hand, what it does not mean is that Catholics think or believe that anybody outside of the church has no possibility of salvation. The church has clarified this on a number of different occasions. You can go back to the church fathers, like Justin Martyr and, and others, who, who very clearly recognize the working of God's Spirit outside the formal boundaries of the church. You can look at Pius IX in the mid-19th century, who was just beatified. Pius IX very clearly says that the Holy Spirit is not limited to yeah. the formal boundaries of the church, although that's the normal means of grace that he uses. I was just thinking that when you and I were Presbyterians, Calvinists, that we believed in the mystical body of Christ. Mm. We believed in this invisible church. Because isn't the problem that what happened during the Reformation is this idea of a structural church was what was set aside, mm. whereas the Catholic Church has always believed in both. Exactly. Isn't that true? Could you talk about that a little more? Because I think that's where some of the confusion is, even for Catholics, mm. this mystical. Because is, is it possible that many Catholics have gone the other extreme and only emphasize the structural and don't mm. recognize the mystical? And the key to good theology and good doctrine is balance. And the balance has between, between understanding the normal means of grace that God gives. The Second Vatican Council spoke of the church as a sacrament. Mm an embodiment of Christ's presence within the world, and the specific sacraments are expressions or channels of that grace. But on the other hand, there's the, the freedom of God to be able to work in whatever way. And the Catholic Church is not so arrogant to think that it can tell God where he can work and where he can't work. Uh -huh. So what it says is that God is a free God, and God can work that same grace that he gives normally through the church, he can also implant in the hearts of those outside the church. And in fact, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that he, he gives that grace to all, at least sufficient yeah. grace, to be able to respond to the invitation of God, even if those individuals don't have an explicit knowledge of Jesus Christ himself. Scripture very clearly teaches that, that uh, God answers the prayers of a righteous man. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. God doesn't just check and see whether his name is on a roll somewhere where they'll mm -hmm. answer those prayers. He's looking mm -hmm. at the person's heart. Right and how faithfully he's responding to his conscience and his information that he has. If the person doesn't, has never heard about Jesus or the church, then that's not criteria necessarily that he'll be judged against. However, if you and I have the opportunity to tell this person, we have a responsibility to do that, mm. right, to share the, 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 the good news. Want to take an email? You right? Sure, that's fine. We've got a couple other questions we can banter around, but maybe they'll be asked by uh, the folks at home. Let's take this first email. Dear Marcus and Kenneth, Try as I might, I can't understand why Mary is given such importance by the Catholic Church. I know some of the fathers romanticized her role, but in Scripture she is just not honored to the degree that Catholics do. As a former Protestant pastor, how could you have ever accepted giving Mary hyperdulia? Jesus apparently never did during his earthly ministry. Thank you for your time. Well, that's an excellent question and very well put. The Hyperdulia, of course, is the term that we use to mean the special veneration that is given to the Blessed Virgin Mary. We give dulia, or veneration, to the saints, but since Mary is the greatest of the saints, we give her the highest of all honor. I think it's interesting when we look at how Mary is treated within the scriptures. If we take, for example, in our Protestant background, we believe that the doctrine of justification by faith alone was an essential part. We believe that it was the that which the church stood or, or fell on. But it's interesting that there's not as many verses in the Bible that deal with that subject as there are those that deal with Mary. I mean, first, the two chapters of the Gospel of Luke, references in John and other verses of, 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 of the New Testament make it very, very clear that Mary is treated extensively within the New Testament. Now, there's so much to say, but, but why do we give her that honor? <clears throat> if you look through the Bible, you will see that different people in the Bible had unique roles to play. Moses alone is the redeemer of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt. Jeremiah alone is the weeping prophet. But there is no one in history, no human being, has ever done what Mary did. She gave the gift of her soul and her body 
to the eternal Word of God, the Son of God, so that He might become man. Now, sometimes we don't read Scripture quite deeply enough, but it's very clear in the story of the Annunciation in Luke chapter 1, when Gabriel comes to Mary, he announces to her that she will bear the child, but then there is, as it were, a pause, and Mary says, let it be done to me according to your word. Now, if that was a fiat declaration of the angel, she wouldn't have to concur with that. She would just be a a puppet, a robot. But what God was doing was asking Mary, Mary, will you cooperate with me in bringing the Son of God into the world? And her fiat, her let it be, was to say, yes, God, I am totally at your disposal. I will do whatever you say. Now, that is a model Christian. Mm-hmm. Anyone who wants to be a, a, a Christ-loving Christian can follow Mary's example. Mm-hmm. There's so much more that we could say about Mary, but, for example, Mary is one who leads us to understand that Jesus is our teacher. In the story of the wedding feast of Cana, you remember how Mary says to the, to the waiters, do whatever he tells you. That's Mary teaching us to listen to Jesus. So why do we honor Mary? Why do we give her such veneration? Because she is, um, she's a great teacher. She's also one who teaches us how to suffer with our Lord in the 19th chapter of John as she stands by the cross and as she suffers with her son in her heart as he redeems the world with his cross. Kind of embarrassed in all our time talking this afternoon and reminiscing. I, I didn't think about mentioning your book, oh. but this... <laughs> Sorry about that. But we here's, talk about that. Yeah, yeah here's the question uh, that brings up the fact that you wrote a book, Mary of Nazareth, which later in the program you'll see the Coming Home Network's address and phone number. And if you're interested in information about Kenneth's book, you could call us or write us. Mary of Nazareth, mm-hmm. which the uniqueness about this book is that you wrote this book as a convert to the church, sensitive to non-Catholics mm-hmm. on the, all these issues of Mary. That's what's an excellent book to answer questions like that. Let's take this next email. This is Diane from Ohio. Hello, Diane. Dear Marcus and Dr. Howell, can you explain the meaning of propitiation Mm -hmm. and expiation as they relate to Christ's death on the cross? I have Protestants tell me that Jesus' death was to cover our sins, past, present, and future, when they refuse to acknowledge that the Mass is a sacrifice. I know that this Protestant doctrine is not biblical, but how can I best explain the Catholic position on what Christ's death accomplished for us? Propitiation and expiation. Everyday words. Uh, <laughs> Kitchen words, right? That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, very, very simply, propitiation is the turning away of God's wrath against sin. And so it's, it's a sacrifice that turns away God's wrath. Expiation is the covering of sin. And so they're very closely related concepts, but in the history of Protestant theology, they've been debated back and forth because some theologians deny that Christ's death in any way turned away God's wrath from us. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that the question that she's asking, though, is slightly different. Well, let me ask, go back there. Both expiation and propitiation are from Scripture in terms of their verses that lead the theologians to have these views in the church. Yeah, in 1 John uh, chapter 4, the Apostle says very clearly that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. Yeah. Now, some of the more modern translations, both Protestant and Catholic, have uh, taken the word propitiation out. But the Greek word helasmos there, helasterion, helasmos it is, says very clearly that this, this is, has a concept in which Jesus Christ's death was not only a covering for our sin, but it, but it in a sense, turned away the wrath of God, which rightly is against our sin, because he took that wrath upon himself. That's why he said uh, today, or he said, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What about the the Lutheran idea of covering? Mm. Now, is that an emphasis, a primary emphasis of of that uh, expiation side? It it, it is, and I I don't think that that's that's not a wrong idea. At all, it, it's built on the Old Testament, mm-hmm. where the priest went into the tabernacle or into the temple, into the holy of holies, and sprinkled blood upon the altar, and he did that to, as as an act of symbolic act of covering mm-hmm. of of the uh, of our sin. Um, 
Jesus Christ's blood covers us from the wrath of God. It protects us. Now, the reason that the Mass is a sacrifice is because the Mass is an embodiment. It is a reliving of that sacrifice. Not that the sacrifice is being made again, but that the one sacrifice on Calvary, as the writer to the Hebrews says, that Christ died once and for all for sin. But that once and for all sin, uh, sacrifice for sin has been made present to us within the church in the Eucharist. Mm. Because the same body of Jesus Christ that died upon Calvary's cross is the body that is present to us within the Eucharist. The idea that the Mass is a sacrifice is built upon the real presence. If Christ is not really present, then certainly it is not a sacrifice. Mm. So in a sense, you can't expect a person to believe that it's sacrificial if these Christ is not there. But we believe that Christ is there, body and blood, soul and divinity. And that means that everything he is, in his death, in his obedient life, in his resurrection, all of that is present to us within the church and therefore is offered back to the Father as a gift from us to him. All right. Let's, um, this looks like a big long email here. Let's try this one, dear. From C.S. Uh, I didn't say Lewis after this. I said just, just something C.S. Uh, <laughs> Dear Marcus and Kenneth, I attend a large independent church in the Midwest that is Presbyterian in its theology. Last year I was elected an elder in my church and am very involved in the ministries of my church. I truly feel that this is my church family, but in the past few years I have gradually reconsidered the theology of the Reformation and now almost completely concur with the teaching of the Catholic Church. I desire to join the Catholic Church, but I am afraid that I would have to sever my ties with my current church and would be deprived of all the avenues of ministry that are now available to me there, which are many. I am also afraid that my church friends would feel that I am abandoning them. What would your guidance be in such a situation? Mm. You know, I, I feel for, for this man or woman because, I mean, you and I went through many of the same questions as do so many clergy yeah. and academics that are considering the church. What's your some yeah. thoughts for them? Well, there's, there's no easy answer to this kind of a question, but it is, um, it's one that has to be approached with a tremendous amount of prayer and individual counsel and, and spiritual direction. I suppose the most important thing I would encourage this person to do is to find a good, solid priest to go and to talk to, uh, to even ask him if he's willing to administer the sacrament of confession, uh, but in, in any case, to go and to begin getting regular spiritual counsel, mm. because this is a journey that's going to take some time. And it's um, the other thing I would do is I would um, perhaps begin sort of throwing things out there to her friends and seeing how they respond to mm. her new ideas. Um, she may not be as badly received as she thinks. Right. Um, it's very possible that uh, there are people that have been thinking the same thoughts mm -hmm. and are waiting for someone to, to bring it up. In, in any case, <clears throat> I don't see, and I'm sure that you don't either, Marcus, see what we left as Presbyterians as being, as being a, totally cut off from that because we appreciate that heritage. It's not as if we have to right. deny all that was good and right and, and wonderful. Many Protestant churches have tremendous um, yeah. Sunday schools and Bible schools and, and, and means of learning and sure. guidance and fellowship. And that doesn't have to be left. Um, in, but, but what becoming Catholic means is that you're coming from that into the fullness of faith. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes because the Catholic Church is so large, it mm -hmm. seems as if you'll never find anything like that in the, in that you have in the Protestant world. And I spoke with a gentleman just this past week about that, that same problem. What I encouraged him is that in every city, in every diocese, there's usually people that you can find that provide that kind of friendship, that kind of support, that kind of encouragement. Um, and if you don't find it on a local level, you can certainly find it by calling the journey, uh, the journey home, by following the, the coming, the coming home network. network. That's right. That's right. I was going to say that often, because we know so many that have made this journey, mm. and often that's that the kind of fellowship that they were accustomed to isn't immediately found maybe in the parish where they go and you get you kind of get stuck you know why won't they come and talk to me when we got to remind ourselves well maybe we need to go out and talk to them mm. we need to make the effort to reach out to people that aren't accustomed to talking to 
Because the other thing I thought about is that when you're a member of such a huge church, after a while you lose track of this person, a visitor, or this someone who's just come back <laughs> after a couple months. So it makes it awkward to go out to talk to someone you don't know very well in large mm -hmm. churches. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to make the effort. This is a question from Laura. Email from Laura. Dear Marcus and Kenneth, in my Bible study, a recent question arose over God hardening Pharaoh's heart. How does one reconcile these passages with the church's teaching on free will? A nice, easy question for you, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for that question. <laughs> that might be the most difficult one we'll get tonight. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's very clear in the, in the book of Exodus from chapter 7 to chapter 10, uh, when the stories of the plagues, that it says a number of times in there, that God actually hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I think we have to you know, reflect upon what that means. But it doesn't mean that God has taken away Pharaoh's free will. But what it means is that God has allowed Pharaoh to be confirmed in the path that he himself mm -hmm. chose. It's precisely God respecting Pharaoh's free will, just as he will respect anyone's free will today. He's not going to force anyone to love him. He's going to offer that. He's going to try to woo them with his own love, but he's not going to force them to do that. So when Pharaoh perhaps heard Moses say, let my people go, and, and then he saw the plague, plague after plague, perhaps there were moments when he said, well, yes, okay, maybe I should let him go, but on the other hand, and he hardened his heart against God. And in those passages, in those three, four chapters, you'll see very interestingly, sometimes it says, Pharaoh hardened That's his right. heart, right. and then it says God hardened his heart. Mm -hmm. And I would like to, I, I think what that means is that, that God allowed Pharaoh to go the course that he was choosing to go. Mm. And, an analogy we might say in, in the modern world today, or our world, is to, is, to, is to realize that God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God predestines none to destruction. But if people go to hell, it's because they've chosen that path. If they choose that path on repeated occasions in their life, increasingly going away from God, God simply lets them have what they want. And that's what that hardening of the heart is. One priest told me one time a very wise statement. He said, it's possible that in the very last moment of our lives, we could cry out to Jesus, Jesus, forgive me what a fool I've been. Let me into your heaven, like a thief on the cross did. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, most people die as they have lived. Mm -hmm. If they've lived hardening their heart against God, they'll probably harden their heart against God at the last moment of their death. Sometimes I, I wonder if that hardening, that, that mystery of that, it's a both and, Pharaoh and God, the mystery mm -hmm. of that interaction between mm -hmm. the work of God and our free will, is a little mm -hmm. bit akin to the dark night of the soul. I mean, the reason that God would pull a distance from somebody is an issue of testing. You know, are they ready to That's take a point. step, like in the book of Job? So Pharaoh had the opportunity to turn against uh, maybe the other inclinations of his heart to turn towards God, you know, and he chose in the other direction. So there's a both end, there's that mystery. That's what's going mystery. on deep within mm -hmm. our heart. Here's a question, another email from Ann in Seattle. Well, this has to do with Dominus Jesus. So, dear Marcus, I have a Lutheran friend who is very upset by Dominus Jesus. He had been drawing closer to the Catholic Church, but felt this letter was arrogant in its claim that the Catholic Church alone has the fullness of truth. He feels that no one can claim to have the fullness of truth, but rather that every church has a piece of it. What might I say to him? Mm. That's an excellent question. I, I suppose the most important thing to emphasize is to go right back to the words of Jesus himself. Because this question is not a question primarily about the church. It's a question about what Jesus taught. Now, you remember at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said to his apostles, Go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The apostles had an obligation from Christ to preach everything, to teach all that he taught, to hold back nothing. This is confirmed in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts when Paul preaches that beautiful sermon to the, uh, the, the presbyters at Ephesus. And he says to them, I have not withheld anything from you. I have proclaimed the entire counsel 
of God. So the responsibility of church leaders is to teach everything that Christ has taught. Now the, the difference between her Lutheran friend's understanding and the Catholic understanding is that many American Protestants think that, that churches sort of specialize in different, different areas of doctrine. Some emphasize this and some emphasize uh, another point. And the church is spread throughout all of these organizations. But if we look in the New Testament, Jesus just didn't give an amorphous body of people. He gave a structure to the church. And the church has apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers. And those apostles appointed others who became known as bishops or episkopoi in Greek. And they had presbyteroi or what came to be called priests later on. In other words, there's not just a mass of people, there's a structure to that. And the question that we have to ask is, where is that, where is that structure, where is that church that Christ founded? That being the case, then, <clears throat> it's not arrogance, but it's faithfulness. Mm -hmm. It's faithfulness to Christ to teach all that he taught. Now, in our day and age, it's very hard for many people to believe that, that a church can proclaim the truth, or that anybody can proclaim the truth, for that matter. Age of relativism. So it seems yeah. very, in a relativistic age, it seems very arrogant for people to claim that they know the truth. We're not saying that we're superior or in triumph over everyone else, but what the church is saying is, as the servant of truth, the church has a responsibility mm -hmm. to teach all that Christ has taught us. Mm -hmm. And that what it's doing is placing that before the world and saying, we're the servants of God, Consider the claims of Christ, mm -hmm. and the church is is the and the servant of God, to be the instrument of salvation within the world. All right, thank you, Ken. Let's take a break. We're back in a moment for more of your questions for Dr. Howe on anything you might like to ask about Christ and His Church. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Dr. Kenneth Howell. He's a convert from the Presbyterian Church. He was a pastor and a seminary professor and now teaches at the University of Illinois. Uh, the, the, the Newman Institute? Yeah, the Newman Institute of Catholic Thought. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that's a great thing. I'm anxious to hear more as that develops. Let's take our first phone call for this evening. evening. This is Angel from Georgia. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hey, Marcus. Um, my question is, which is more important? the doctrine or ritual of the church, or what is in a person's heart. All right, thank you, Angel. The doctrine, what's more important? The doctrine, or the rituals, or what's in the person's heart? Well, it's hard to say that any one of them is more important. They're all important, Angel, because um, the liturgy that we have is our, the ritual, the liturgy, is our, is our way of worshiping our Lord. And in the end, that's a picture of what heaven is going to be. What's uh, the doctrine keeps us faithful to God. It lets us know that we worship a God of truth, and that, that God of truth has spoken to us. And so as we, as we worship God, we want to worship him, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. And so it's so important for us to have that doctrine and to be able to know it. But in, in probably in, in the final analysis, of course, God is going to judge us on what's in our heart. Yeah. Just as he did the thief on the cross when he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That man didn't know much. He didn't have much knowledge of who Jesus was. But he at least recognized that Jesus was the Savior. And so he said to him, um, you today, you will be with me in paradise. It's All of these things are important for different reasons. We have to have the doctrine to know what Christ taught us. We have to have the ritual or the liturgy to know how to worship God. But what's in our heart is to be conformed to that truth and expressed in our worship to God in the, in the liturgy of the church. I remember in seminary, a professor talking about 
trying to show that the, uh, the relationship between freedom mm -hmm. and yet uh, you know, the rules of the church or the rules of, of Christianity, and he was talking about when is a, tr a train most free when it's on mm. the tracks or off the tracks? Mm. Or when is a fish most free when it's in the water or out of the water? Mm. You know, a train can only fulfill its function when it's on the tracks, and then it's free. Mm. And that's the relationship between the teachings of the church and the freedom of our, our hearts. Mm. Our hearts need to be guided by the teachings so that we can interpret the voices within to make sure we're listening to the right voice. I mean, we hear our heart, but where's that voice coming from, or how is it influenced by all of those around us? We need the teaching, because sometimes the teaching calls us to make difficult decisions that our heart may not want to, where our heart may not want to go, mm. but yet we're called to do what's right. We see many examples of that in Scripture, mm. where people were called to do what's right, even though they, they didn't want to do that. Mm. So, so it's a good balance, keeping that balance. Another email. This is from Robert, Marcus, and Ken. Given the explanation you just gave regarding Dominus Jesus, are we Catholics responsible for sharing the fullness of truth with our separated brethren? Totus to us. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I think it's a tongue-in-cheek question here. Isn't it? I mean, uh, <laughs> I guess the short answer is yes. <laughs> it's very clear that not only do we have an obligation, but we have a privilege of being able yeah. to do that. In, in the way that you know, I would like to approach it from the point of view of to ask the question, what is true love? True love is reaches out to a person in the hope that you can have that person share in the fullness of life. One way of defining the Trinity is that it is a community of life and love between the three mem divine members of the Trinity. What we want people to do is to share that love. And that love is expressed fully within the church and the fullness of all that it teaches. And so we reach out to them with the hope that, that they will be able to share mm -hmm. in the fullness of the divine life. All right. Thank you, Kenneth. Let's take our next caller. This is Blanca from Massachusetts. <coughs> Hello, Blanca. What's your question for us tonight? Hello. Um, well, God bless EWTN and Mother Angelica. Yeah, my you. question is, well, my father is in the hospital in a coma. Mm -hmm. um, his second wife, has com she's Jehovah's Witness. And I think he converted to Jehovah Witness from Catholicism. So when I went to the hospital to see him, um, I was frantically looking for the chaplain, uh, trying to get a mass for him, letting her know people are praying. And she just looked at me and she said, oh, there's only one God. Hmm. So I don't know how, what, you know, yeah. and, I, and to this day I still don't know what to say to her. Yeah. So the, first of all, this is one of those questions where... Uh, we obviously can't do counseling over television, but we would strongly encourage you to go locally to a priest to talk about these very issues mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. But a couple questions there is, how do you approach someone from the Jehovah Witness faith? Mm -hmm. Or what do you do with parents that are sharing a different faith? How do you approach mm -hmm. them with the truth of the mm -hmm. church? That is a very difficult question, but I think, that Blanca, the, the most important thing for you to realize is that, that your prayers, your sacrifices, and those of other, your fellow Catholics who are willing to do that for your father are going to be most effective. And, and the effect of that in your father's heart may not be seen by you or anyone else on this earth. But it's important for us to live by faith and trust that as we offer up our sacrifices for those that are dying, for those that are stray from the church, that the Lord, in the mystery of his providence, will, will work and bring people back. So. First of all, be confident in, in God's mercy toward your father. I think the other thing that's so important to realize about a person in that condition is that um, they can be very, very confused. And your father probably is confused, not only because of his sickness, but because of all the years of being taught various kinds of religious doctrines that are contrary to the church. But don't let that discourage you in terms of continuing to speak to him. If he, once he comes out of the coma, or even speaking to his, his second wife, say, yes, I believe there's one true God, and that's why I want to have a Mass said for my father, so that the Father's mercy will flow up, down to my father. As Marcus said, these are just a few of ideas, but, but do try to get with a trusted spiritual counselor, a priest or a religious, 
who has experience in these matters and um, and keep that person close to you and to your family during this very difficult time and we promise you our prayers. Well, yeah, notice and know that because you have mentioned this to us and on the show that the sisters and the brothers here and all of us as a family, BWTN, will be lifting you and your family before the Lord in prayer. Absolutely. I mean, that's our promise because that's the most significant thing we can do for one another is trust mm-hmm. that our prayers are heard and that God's grace can touch and change hearts. Let's take this next question, another question on Dominus Jesus from Bill. As a layman, he's an RCIA, I read Dominus Jesus and quickly realized that I was reading a technical document. I know I didn't understand some terms. Could you define economy and unicity as it relates <laughs> to Dominus Jesus? Yes, economy is a very um, straightforward word. It, doesn't, it has to do with the order of salvation. The word economy in English comes from a Greek word, oikonomia, and oikonomia means the arrangement, <clears throat> the divine arrangement. So what it means, the economy of salvation, it means the, the way in which God has ordered salvation through time and in the church. So Christ has given the sacraments. And he could have just simply, by fiat, said, well, you're forgiven and you go to heaven. But he's given us an economy or an arrangement of salvation through the ministry of the church. Uh, the other word, unicity, I think is an unfortunate choice in English because the, what they're really speaking of is uniqueness. It means the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and the uniqueness of, uh, of the Catholic Church. Um, I wish they would translate the word uniqueness rather than unicity. The Latin word behind it is very clear, and it means the singularity, the particular, the one and only. All right, we have another email. Tricia in Maryland, a gentleman. I'm very interested in how to bring fallen away Catholics back to church. There is so much truth to be shown through the Catholic Church, yet I never know where to start while trying not to be too aggressive about it. I am very concerned about the salvation of these people, and I want to convey that without convey that without starting arguments. Yeah. Some suggestions. That's a very difficult question too, because it depends so much upon the individual. But here's just a few things that the person can do. As you get to know people, I think you begin where they are. If you ask them questions about their faith, find out what's important to them. Um, if they're evangelical Christians, you'll find often that they'll emphasize a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm. Then I would emphasize that in my uh, conversation with them, that, that the most personal relationship that you have found on this earth with Jesus Christ is when you can receive him in the Holy Eucharist, uh, body and blood, soul and divinity. Or that in, in, in prayer, in the richness tradition of prayer, if prayer is something that's important to them, suggest that you teach, maybe teach them the rosary or the Divine Mercy Chaplet or other forms of prayer. Give them a little prayer book. Um, I have a friend of mine who lives in Italy, an American friend, and I recently sent him a, a prayer book of St. Benedict, and he's not a Catholic, but he wanted to deepen his prayer life. And already, and through emails, we began to discover that he is learning more and more uh, about the faith through this prayer. So those are some ways in which a person can do that. The other thing is to study a little bit about where their church is and to find um, where their concerns are and to begin to address them or ask them directly, you know, I'm Catholic and, and you're not. What do you think about the Catholic Church? Have you ever considered it? There's nothing wrong with asking that person that question. All right, got another email for you, Ken. From Leonard uh, Wathen, uh, Journey Home, Jesus said, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. I realize that the possibility of salvation exists outside the church, so what implications does this verse have for those who do not receive communion? Yeah, it's a very good question. What First of all, that's from John chapter 6. Right, exactly. That's Christ in the midst of him saying eight times the importance of eating in his body and drinking his blood. So it's a very key verse in the midst yeah, of that. Yeah. Well, the, the Eucharist is absolutely essential to our, to our health and to our salvation. But what we have to remember is this, that what we receive in the Eucharist is Jesus Christ himself. And in no other sacrament do we receive his body and his blood as we do in that sacrament. But what we receive is the Lord himself. 
Now the question is, is there any other way that Christ comes to us? And of course the answer is yes, because he comes to us in baptism, he comes to us in confirmation, he comes to us in the sacrament of reconciliation when we are absolved of our sins. Mm. So Christ has chosen as the means of the normal means of grace to receive him. And what Jesus then is saying is that the, in the normal economy of salvation, the sacrament of the Eucharist is absolutely essential. But again, God is a sovereign God. He's not limited to using uh, bread and wine or water. He can work outside of that and give his divine life to those that are outside the boundaries of the church. Mm -hmm. Now for other Christians who are baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, they've already been infused with that divine life by virtue of their baptism, mm -hmm. regardless of what they believe about it. And baptism is baptism regardless of a person's beliefs. But for those that have not been baptized, there still can be and is a work of grace that goes, that can come into that person's heart as an exception to the rule, as it were. Now the church doesn't say that everybody outside the church is going to be saved. No. All it says is that the possibility of salvation is not excluded for them. But the surest way to have confidence that we'll end up our life with God in heaven is to live with, with him faithfully within the bounds of the church. I need to ask you a question because this is a question that I received from viewers uh, by email and phone call. Uh, and, and this caller was alluding to it, but there are some that are not comfortable with the teaching of the church today on the issue of salvation outside the church. There are many that, that wonder is this what the church has always taught? There are some that go so far to say the church has changed her teaching on that, and they would mm -hmm. quote quotes from St. Augustine and others, uh, Saint, uh, Pope Boniface and others. I mean, deal with this issue, because there are, I know are many that struggle with this uh, and dogma. You're, you're the asking the question, has the church changed, it, changed its view on this particular On the way? issue of salvation outside the church. Yeah, yeah. The most important thing for us to do when we're dealing with trying to understand doctoral questions is not to look at it from our limited perspective. Mm. Many people have an experience of Catholicism in their life and they, they think that's all Catholicism is. But what we have to do is, I mean, that's the beauty of the church that we expand our vision to look at all of the ages and what has been taught. Mm. Now, when we <clears throat> look at this question, what we find is that there's been two streams of teaching within the church that have always been held in balance. On the one hand, the church has always said that outside the church there is no salvation. And so that means that the church is the instrument of God within the world to bring salvation to the world. But on the other hand, the church has taught that others outside the church, who are not formal members of the church, can also find salvation by special acts of grace of God perhaps by the Christians who are baptized but are not, through no fault of their own, mm -hmm. are outside the church. Now to show you that this is not just a recent teaching, you can go back to the mid-19th century and look at Pius IX's documents. He gave a, a, an allocution to the bishops. He gave another speech at the Vatican during his time. And he talks about the fact <clears throat> that those outside the church, who through no fault of their own, with invincible ignorance, are not members of the church. They are not excluded from salvation. <clears throat> what about those strong statements, like St. Bonavis's statement or St. Augustine's statement, that, that make that very clear? Because yeah. well, often those are the things that are quoted. Yeah, St. Saint Augustine says in one very clear passage in his writings, he says to the, he says to the Donatists that are, that are in a separate church, of separated from the church, he says, you have the sacraments, you have the blessing, you have the singing, you have the gospel, but if you don't have the church, you don't have salvation. And that sounds very exclusivistic, right? But what he's saying is, these are not people that are living in invincible ignorance. That is, that they don't know the church. These are people that have left the church. Yeah. These are people that have self-consciously and willingly denied the church of Christ. Would you say that almost every one of those quotes, as you look back, that seemed to have this very nailed view. If you looked at the context, yeah. they were almost always addressed to those very people who should have known better and yeah. had chosen to take a step outside the church. I, I think that's... Now, to show you again that this the church has not changed, if you read Lumen Gentium, the document from the Vatican Council on the church, 
it says that people who willingly leave the church, knowing that it is the church, are putting their souls in peril because the church is Christ's gift to us. Mm -hmm. And we cannot refuse Christ's gift and expect to find salvation with him. But that's different than a person outside the church who doesn't know or understand the church at all. Now my guess, and this is just a personal guess, that there are many Catholics who've left the church, but they really didn't understand what the church was teaching. They really are in ignorance about what the true teaching is or that it is the true Church of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Ken. We've got another email here from Robert in Ohio. This might be a good one to kind of summarize, maybe even close this portion. Uh, Ken, what was the turning point for you in seeing the truth of the Catholic Church? <laughs> well, Robert, I, I really want to thank you for asking that question <laughs> because uh, that's a moment that is uh, indelibly inscribed on my memory. Um, as I mentioned before, when I was a Protestant minister and attending Mass, I had become convinced in my mind that I would, that I should perhaps investigate and understand the Catholic Church. And I was willing to go as far as I could. I understood the Eucharist as the real presence of Christ, and I embraced it. But there was one particular day when I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had to become a Catholic. And that was the day when I was at Mass, on a weekday Mass, and the priest lifted up the host and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How happy are those who have been called to his supper. And I looked at the host, and I said to myself, My God, I really believe that is Jesus Christ in this church today. And I knew that if I believed that that what appeared to be bread was really the Lord of heaven and earth, then I had to follow him no matter what would come in my life. And that day I knew that no matter how long it would take me, someday I would become a Catholic. And perhaps I'd like then to, to, to use that to emphasize one point. Conversion, whether it is of a person outside the church to the church, or whether it's a cradle Catholic who needs to be converted all over again, is not a matter of human creativity or intelligence. It is an act of grace where the spirit enters into the soul and illumines the mind where a person can see Christ in all of his wonder and all of his fullness. That's the only way for us ever to enter into the joys of heaven. Kenneth, thank you so much for that. it does remind us the importance of the conversion of a heart. I remember often that the, the apologetic battles between the faith alone, faith yeah. only, yeah. or those that are arguing for, no, it's faith, but also in our love and charity, and the arguments that go on, and sometimes I wonder, are the, either of them hearing the importance of conversion of the heart, yeah. the centrality of it's got to be in here? Because if we're, would you say, let me ask you this question, maybe in closing one, and open up a big can of worms maybe, but if, would you say that if, if the people before the Reformation, if there was a, a, a more prevalent conversion of the heart, yeah. the Reformation may never have happened. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. Yeah, because it's very, very clear that the church has always been mixed <laughs> yeah. with great saints and great sinners. And if, the, if that deep conversion was preached and taught and expected and looked for, when every time we went to Mass, if we said to God, God, today I want to be more deeply converted so that I can love you more and serve you more. I think we would find a much greater level of holiness within the church. Thank you, Ken. Thank yeah. you very much for joining us again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Marcus. Be back someday Come again. Be great. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of closing comments. We Always in the journey home, our goal is to talk about the fullness of the faith. You've heard me say in the past that sometimes the reason that prevents people from coming home to the church this can be ignorance or just not knowledge of the teaching of the church. Sometimes it's prejudice. What people think they know isn't true, so it blocks them from hearing the fullness. Sometimes it's bad examples, bad Catholics. We don't live our faith, and so we embarrass. Uh, we turn people off from the church. Sometimes it's pride. But sometimes I also wonder if it's that people want a comfortable Jesus. They just want a Jesus that will teach what's easy. Jesus wants us to be faithful to him and live in the fullness. So let's pray for one another 
as we walk together on the journey home.